Welcome everyone. I see people hopping on. We'll give it a minute here just to let the last few, you know, a few more people click on boxes and buttons and, and hopefully join us. All right, we seem to be holding steady right around uh, right around this number of folks joining in. So we'll get started. Um, to everyone out there who I cannot see, um, my name is Kevin Foote. I am a member of the 2023 uh, Chicago Yakla Brace Mackinac Committee. Um, it is my pleasure this evening to welcome Nick Olson and his team from Predict Wind uh, back. Uh, this is a predict our second year of working together. Uh, so thank you, Nick and team. Uh, welcome back as a, not only a, a, a compadre in working together, but also as a sponsor uh, for the race. Um, uh, we're gonna do a, as, as Nick described it, an introduction tonight to predict wind and some of the tools uh, with, the, uh, with the idea that we're all starting from uh, from maybe not scratch, but a pretty, pretty low level of not knowing uh, that much about Predict Win. Uh, I think as most of you know out there, this is the first of a series of three webinars. We'll be doing the second installment, I guess, Predict Win 201 uh, tomorrow night. And then in, uh, what is it, two weeks or so from this evening, uh, we'll be following on getting a little more in depth with the routing and the and the offshore capabilities. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Nick and his group. Uh, I will ask that everybody, as you get questions or as questions come up, please please put them in the Q and A section. Uh, we're going to reserve the chat for if you're having any sort of technical problems or you can't hear something or whatever. Throw that in the chat. But as far as questions specific to Predict Wind or anything that we're talking about. Uh, please show that in the Q&A because someone from the Predict Win team will uh, be answering those real time as we go along. So if, uh, if you have a question, put it there. If you want to see the answer, keep watching there. With that, Nick, take it away. Thanks very much. Um, and yeah, it's a pleasure to be here. Um, I don't see Karen uh, joining just yet, but she will come in later. But um, I can also go and check the Q&A box every now and then if need be. Um, so as mentioned, you know, we're really gonna just do uh, an introduction and run through some of the more fundamental stuff. I think, you know, it's really easy for those of us that have used um, Predict Wind for a while to sort of forget that someone coming in perhaps doesn't know uh, some of the things we're talking about and we assume, uh, assume the knowledge, which, um, you know, even if you do know a fair bit, um, sometimes having someone else explain it to you again might clear up something you were just unsure about. Um, but I will just jump straight into a screen share so that you don't have to look at me all um, all evening. And let's change that over. And just sort of just talk a little bit about what Predict Wind is. I mean, we specialize in. Um, marine forecasting so that is our area of focused uh, focus we are um, uh, a new zealand based company um we uh, do this all around the world and so I'm just, and and um you know the us is uh, actually our biggest market um and yeah so because we focus on uh water activities um you know we tend to have better and more um, focused products towards marine users. And so in particular, you know, um, 
sailors, uh, you know, we're all sailors at Predict Wind. Uh, we do do some power boating as well um, and fishing and things like that. But but primarily we're sailors. Um, and so you'll see a lot of the stuff we do is focused around sailing. Um, so, yeah, Predict Wind's been around for about, I think we're about 14 years now. It was started by uh, my boss, John, who still works in the company every day. He was with um, the Swiss America's Cup team, Alingi, until um, uh, until Oracle beat them uh, in the dog match. And um, but when that, when they when he was involved there, they did a ton of research into weather models and development of weather models, and that was yeah sort of where Predict Wind started was from the weather modelling and also uh, guys in the team when they're going to do other regattas wanted forecasts and um it sort of started there uh but the you know i think at the time john thought it was all going to be pretty easy but you know here we are 14 years later and um we're probably doing more development than ever um you know to to try and deliver uh forecasts to people in a way that they can digest it there's lots of uh weather sources out there um and so our goal is you know to give you the best weather sources and to make it so that you can understand it and use it in a in a in a meaningful manner so whether that's safety or getting to the finish line faster you know there's a, a bunch of tools that we have in place around that um so yeah so that's sort of a bit of background uh you'll see here i've got all this list of features and we'll probably talk about uh, much of these today um and so, you know, we've got the, the regular things, you know, your, your forecast maps and the tables, and, and we'll run through all of that. Um, weather routing is probably really key to anyone doing the, the Chicago Mac race. Um, I think if you're not doing weather routing, you're really putting yourself at a, a pretty big disadvantage um, versus those that are, uh, you know, in many aspects, you know, from positioning, sail selection, you know, planning it, it it all it all adds up. Um, you know, personally, I've done a fair bit of uh, racing using the weather routing, and just the the you know the more you understand that, the more you use that, uh, the the better it gets. Uh, departure planning that's actually more of a a cruising um, related tool, and so re if you if you maybe even. If you're doing the race and you're heading back, you might actually use that tool to pick a, a nice time to depart. Um, you know, you can you can select the difference between whether it was leaving in the morning or the afternoon, or today, tomorrow, or the next day. Uh, that the departure planning tool is super powerful for that stuff. And you know, whether you're going to have a downwind trip or you're sailing, you know, it's on the nose most of the way. I should put that pen down because I'm clicking it. Um, you know, it's a really powerful tool. Um, you know, alerts and observations, they actually tie together in some way. We actually have observation alerts as well. So you could set up some observations on the lake if you knew there was a change coming through. You could actually have an observation that would alert, uh, an, an observation alert that would let you know when that front or, or whatever it was was moving through can be a pretty useful tool. Um, but we also have forecast alerts. So whether you wanted to go wing foiling or... Um, you know, fishing or what, whatever it is that you're doing, you can have uh, alerts set up to, to let you know that any time those conditions that you're looking for are met. Uh, and I have one set up all the time for when I want to go winging. Um, it lets me know every time it's above 15 knots at a particular location. Um, yeah, GPS tracking um, is, again, it's a cruising feature, um, but something that is that we do do uh, for the race is you can actually see all the boats within Predict Wind. You can even overlay that with your weather routing where everyone is if you want. Um, so being able to see that on a SAT connection is pretty awesome. And um, we'll talk about that later. Uh, ocean data, uh, we don't actually have um, data for the Great Lakes. So that's, we will gloss over that one. And daily briefing is actually a written forecast um that consolidates it, it's, it's for a specific spot and it consolidates all the um 
all the forecasts into a, a written uh, a text forecast for the morning and the afternoon, evening, etc. And um, yeah, it's it's actually quite cool. Uh, sometimes you'll find if you're going sailing or you're going fishing, you'll see different things. I can look at the forecast and because I want it to be light winds because I'm going fishing, or I want it to be windy because I'm going sailing or whatever it is, I'll look at the forecast of the different um, you know, different lens. Uh, but the daily briefing kind of cuts all that out. It's an algorithm uh, that that's taking outliers out and, and actually giving you a pretty succinct um, you know, rundown of what the daily conditions are going to be. Uh, local knowledge is a feature that, you know, there's some um, actually really cool information around there, around historical weather data. So if you're going to a, a new location or you want to know what the average wind speeds are in a particular month for any location, there's historical weather data in there. So it's a 10 year average data. Um, and there's also spots, or, or, you know, if you haven't been somewhere before, there's usually some information in there about that location, facilities, etc. Uh, graphs, tables, we'll, we'll go and look at those, um, and AIS data, so we have a full um, range of sat sat uh, satellite and terrestrial AIS data in PredictWin now, uh, particularly useful um, when you're, you know, if you're looking for traffic um, wherever you are, so. Uh, so really, I probably before I get too far into any of this, we should, I'll flick over to I've closed the page I wanted. I just need to move my Zoom controls. Just open up another page here because I want to use a particular page here and just talk about the apps that we offer. Okay, so to use any of the tools, um, you need to be, a, you know, a registered you need to sign up where, um, you know, we do have a free version of Product Wind, freemium we call it, uh, and it has a lot of information in it. Um, and it's probably the free version is probably more comparable to something like Windy or some of the other free apps out there. And, um, you know, there's a lot of really awesome stuff in there. And, you know, even using that will sort of lead into some of the other stuff we do. We do. Um, if you are at home or, you know, day sailing, staying within cell phone range, um, you use the Predict Wind app, or if you're at home or at work and looking at weather, you, use a, you can use the uh, Predict Wind website. And so that's all the, what we see over here. It doesn't save data offline. So if you're doing um, something where you're going offline for a period of time, you would use the offshore app because it saves your data offline. Um, so there's no Grib viewer in the Predict Wind app. What uh, Grib is, is just the, the file format that we use for transferring weather files. Um, whereas the offshore app is a, is a Grib viewer. Um, it's not, um, you know, it doesn't interface with uh, satellite connections. That being said, if you had Starlink, it would interface with that, of course, because that's basically the same as using, uh, you know, a home connection. So a lot of powerful features in the Predict Wind app and website. It's what we'll mainly look at today. In fact, it's 100% what we'll look at today. Um, and then what we do, um, and it basically anytime I was going, I'm going racing, I will use the offshore app. Primarily because even if I know I'm going to be in cell coverage, I want to be able to just open up that tool at any time and look at where I am, see what the routing says, and you know, and anything else I want to look at. And I don't; everything's already preloaded, so um, I will use that even if I'm doing, um, you know, a fifty mile around the around the coast. I will use the offshore app, um, and that would be the same if I was. Uh, doing a 10 day passage or, you know, or whatever, sailing anywhere where I was going out of cell coverage, I would use the offshore app. So it will do your weather routing, departure planning. Um, all the files are in grip format. Um, so we download them and we'll go through how we do that and, and what we do. So we'll sort of touch on that tomorrow. Um, and then in a couple of weeks, we're really going to focus on how we would use the offshore app for the 
the race itself and um, and some of the features in there and how we might interpret uh, some of the information we're seeing. And I'll, we'll actually talk about uh, basically every time we look at a feature, I'm just naturally going to talk about interpretation, um, which is yeah, which is a good thing. So <laughs> that's sort of really uh, the main pieces of software we have. Um, you can use the you can use either piece of software on um, any iOS device. So by iOS, I mean your iPhone or your um, iPad or an Android device. So, you know, whether you've got a Samsung or a whatever other, um, and you can tell them I'm a Mac user, um, <laughs> Android or, or, or PC. Um, so, you know, basically we cover all of those main platforms. So, you, you know, unless you're using something pretty obscure, uh, you can use the Predict Win software on those devices. Um, yeah. Righty ho. So we briefly touched on some of the features. And so something that's probably um, of interest to people when, and uh, will take a fair bit of understanding around what we do um, is that we do have a fair range of models. Um, we don't just add any model in um, before we add any model into PredictWind. We will uh, run validation studies um, for you know and, and compare its uh, its accuracy with other models and and against observations. And so later on, we'll have a look at a, a tool that we call validation, which um, you can actually look at a location and see which model's been performing well recently. Um, and it's always a surprise to me because I never check those before I do a webinar. And so we'll go and have a look at that that tool, uh, the validation tool. Um, which allows you to see which which model's doing a good job, you know, in the last week and over the last month. Um, <clears throat> but so, I mean, what does yeah, you know, what is a what is a weather model? You know, when you look at a wind map or you look at an isobar map, um, generally, you know, or you're watching the news, generally you should really know what weather model you're looking at. They are all different. They have um different what we call initial conditions so a weather model starts with a snapshot of the world um, or whatever or the region if it's a regional model and that is you know all of the things that you would think of you know uh, satellite data um, observations balloon data um, you know everything all, all the information that they can get and then they put that into a uh, program which spits out what we could call an initial conditions file um, and it's a it's a big uh, job to create that initial conditions file and um, and so the, and from there that is then when it when that data goes into a weather model and the weather model will then start saying in three hours six hours you know 12 hours four days whatever it is that will start looking at um you know give, that's your forecast so we have the initial conditions the snapshot of the world at the, at, or, or the region at that time and then we um you know and then we run that model uh that, that those initial conditions in a model which is essentially a complex algorithm um and i'll just sort of talk through some generalizations about each of them um so the ecmwf is uh, as you can see there in the description, it's from the European Centre for Medium Range Weather Forecasts. It is considered the number one global model um, from a national weather service. It is it is very good. Um, you'll see it, when, you often see it when you, um, on the news when they're talking about uh, hurricanes. Um, you know, they'll talk about the Euro model. That's what they're talking about is the ECMWF. Um, we have it at nine kilometer resolution for the whole world, which so resolution um, is basically the granularity of a model. And I'll talk more about resolution once we go down to the regional models. Um, but, you know, having 9K blocks for the entire world is actually pretty impressive. 
um, and it takes a massive amount of computing power for them to run that forecast out to 10 days uh, at that resolution. Um, it's something that you'll want to know is when, uh, how often a model updates and when it updates, and we'll look at that later. Um, but knowing when models update is really important because then you know that you've got new data. And then we'll, there's other models that will update more regular than uh, regularly than others. So ECMWF is, wins all the um, National Weather Service sort of uh, studies that they do. Um, and then we, another model that we have is called Spire. Um, it's a private uh, weather model, works particularly well in uh, remote locations. Uh, in the study that we did, we found that it um, was actually able to beat the ECMWF, especially on the on the water, um, and that was we were pretty surprised by that. It's it, it's what what is also great about it is it has a unique way of collecting those initial conditions, um, and so it uses something they called uh, they call radio occultation, where they shoot radio waves through the atmosphere and the refraction that they measure from that gives them a whole data set which they put into their model um, and so it's yeah it's really cool and it's nice to have um, something that's done a little bit differently um, and then knowing that it it, it performs well um, in general um, is yeah it's pretty cool because it's both the ECMWF and the Spire um, are models that we buy um, we have to pay to get the data um, and so that's why you don't see them uh, in as many places as you do, for instance, the GFS, which thanks to Noah, they give it away for free. UKMO is the UK Met Service. Um, it, it's the, considered to be the number two um, global weather model for from a um, national weather service. It yeah d d does pretty well. Um, and yeah, the, the, if, if you're over in Europe, they've actually just released a high resolution model um, down to 2K, which is is pretty cool. Uh, the GFS, you're probably familiar with it. Um, it's, it's main the, the main issue with the GFS is its resolution. Really, it is a good model. It's especially good you know, offshore, um, but in your coastal situations, it's not going to pick up any thermal or land effects uh, because of its resolution. Um, they run it at 13K, but the output that you see is 27K. So you'll sometimes see people saying uh, that, that they have the GFS 13K. That's true. Um, but the reality is you're looking at a 27K resolution, um, which yeah, doesn't help for you uh, when you're anywhere near land. <laughs> Uh, so the PWE and the PWG uh, were the models that we run. Um, and so when I mentioned the initial conditions earlier, uh, we actually don't create the initial conditions ourselves. We get the initial conditions from NOAA and from ECMWF. So that is as far as it goes, so far as them being... Um, sometimes you'll hear people say that we modify the GFS in the ECMWF. That's actually incorrect. It is a full model run from initial conditions phase. So we just use that snapshot of the world and they're at the PWG and the PWE are the same algorithm, um, but they just have different initial conditions. Uh, and so, which is, if you ever go and have a look at them, it's actually really fascinating uh, to look at that you can be using the same weather model, but two different initial conditions and you can get quite different um, outputs, especially as, as you run into the future. Uh, the uh, sort of the superpower, I guess, is probably um, shorter term um, and we run them at high resolution, which we'll look at in a second. Um, just as a generalization, and I say this pretty loosely as a generalization, ECMWF is um, does a it does a good really good job in general, but if you're looking at longer term and you can't see consensus between the models, then the ECMWF does a very good job generally longer term, and we can check that out in the validation later. Um, but really, we would be looking 
uh, longer term, we'd be looking for consensus. And so, I mean, the similarities between how the models look over time. Okay. So we'll come down here to high resolution regional models. Um, so as I mentioned before, resolution is important, especially um, when you're near the coast um, and when you're getting thermal effects um, or land effects. Uh, they High resolution models take massive amounts of computing power. Um, so we run the PWG and the PWE at eight kilometers and then we downscale it again and run it at one kilometer. The one kilometer modeling that we do, and um, I can probably bring up a map, but it's you know in select coastal areas around the world and on the Great Lakes that those running those models takes more computing power than running the global model and the 8k combined like a lot more so there's a lot more that goes into high resolution modeling and so again what i mean by resolution is you'll see here i say it says it's 1k so that means that it's actually calculating all the parameters in that one kilometer grid box and so it assumes everything's the same in that box but because those areas are small you do get effect you know you can see it'll it'll pick up you know the land heating or or whatever it is of these big cliffs it will pick up that sort of stuff the effects of the of the land um and the changes in in in, in that situation uh not relevant to what we're talking about the UKMO um it's pretty new uh the 2k um, but that's actually super impressive because they run it for five days um, and they're updating it quite quickly um, early on. So still waiting for more feedback on that one, but it's in, and not totally relevant to you guys. Uh, and nor is the Arome. So unless you're going over to Europe to go yacht racing, um, the, the UK and Arome are not relevant. Uh, the NAM is totally relevant to you guys. Um, it's, uh, you know, the North American model, it is higher resolution. It's five kilometer resolution. So not, you know, over here, we're talking about the 1K versus 5K, um, but it covers the whole of North America um, and is updated six hourly. So, and runs out to 84 hours. So very useful to look at um, and, 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 to forecast off. And you'll see here that we, um, the PWG and the PWE, they run 36 hours. So that's from uh, initial conditions out to the time that that one kilometer forecast ends is 36 hours. Uh, you'll see the, the HUR or the HRRR. Um, really good for your short term, um, you know, stuff any you know particular timings of um changes coming harder to uh we don't actually put it in our weather routing uh because it's harder to model off you know to get something you know in the future because it's always updating uh, you know a good forecast actually allows you to plan ahead and strategize ahead um, but for your short-term timings very very useful um so yeah we have that in there um a, Point of note uh, is that we have just actually added the NAM into our weather routing. So everything that you're looking at, um, and it's it's combined with the GFS. So actually early on, uh, all your GFS routing is actually using the NAM model. Um, it's still a work in progress um, to, to, just, to actually show you that we're using the NAM. But just that is an important piece of information that you should know that if you're looking at weather routing or departure planning uh, for that, if you're within the range, uh, the, the geographical area of the NAM, um, you should, and or the time range, that is what your weather routing will be using. Okay, I probably shouldn't talk about weather models for too long. I don't know whether anyone's still listening <laughs> after weather models. Um, we have done a webinar on it. Uh, you can find that on our um, the Predict Wind um, 
uh, uh, YouTube channel. Sorry, I just looked at something else. Lost my chain of thought. Uh, we we did a webinar on uh, weather models, and um, amazingly, it was the most popular webinar we've ever done. Um, so <laughs> go and have a look at that on our YouTube channel if you if you wish. Righty ho. So let's. Sorry, I shouldn't use such so many Kiwi colloquialisms. Okay, so what I've done now is I have um, moved away from um, our sales site and gone into um, our forecast website. So this is the same as if you were looking at the Predict Wind app. Um, so this is not offshore app. So we're looking at, um, we're on the web and looking at forecast.predictwind.com. So if you come in here, um, you'll see that I've obviously been interested in the sale GP. Um, and I've got uh, this location set up here. So first thing to know about uh, everything that you're looking at in these uh, maps down over here is they are location based. So I've set that location there, that little green dot, that's that's my location that I've set. And I can set new locations um, in here and I can delete them in here as well. And But just you need to realize that everything you look at in the tables and the graphs um, is, is based on that specific location. And it's really important to, to use that to your advantage um, because it means that, um, you know, if you, wherever you, you can't look at the forecast here, here, and think that it's going to be the same up here. You know, you, you need a different location set. Um, so, you know, and then where I live in Auckland, uh, that can, I can go five kilometers and I've got, or less, and I've got a completely different forecast. So really important to know that, you know, when you're looking at this stuff, that you're looking at a, a particular spot. Of course, you can go to the wind maps like we're in here and look at a bigger, a bigger picture. Um, you know, and see, a, you know, wider range of um, of right wider area. So, as I mentioned before, we have the daily briefing, and that is, um, you know, giving us our just our essential rundown of what's what's happening today and um, can do a very good job of it, especially if you don't like looking at tables. Um, yeah, I don't think we need to talk about that. It's pretty self-explanatory. Um, and yeah, it, do, it does work well. There's professional sailors that use this just because they like the simplicity of it. Um, and some, you know, some also some really basic things like trends. Um, you know, when... Um, John was doing the America's Cup and even stuff that I talk to my kids about before they go sailing is the breeze, you know, they'd wanted, you know, Russell Coates would want to know, is the breeze increasing or decreasing? Is it going left or right? You know, what are the trends for the day or the morning or, or for the next, you know, hour? Um, and so trends are a really important thing to think about when you're looking at any forecasts, weather routing, you know, what is the trend um, and how, you know, sometimes I, someone will say to me, oh, the forecast wasn't that good today. And I'll be like, well, you know, it might've said, oh, it was going from eight to 12 and maybe it went from 10 to 15. And, um, you know, <laughs> that's actually pretty good. So I've just clicked over here on the tables and, you know, and what my point is there, if you look at the trends, you know, it's increasing. That's actually what you need to know. I know what I've got in front of me here, and I know that the trend is to increase or and then go left or right. Um, so I'm here in the tables. And again, you know, there's all of these models here. There's a you know a lot of information in there. If you don't like that, you can use the daily briefing, or you can actually collapse this. Um I'm clicking on the left side of the screen there, and it's actually averaging all the models out, uh, which can be a nice thing to do. Um, but 
it's not my my cup of tea. Um, I'm definitely into looking across all the models and looking for trends. Um, not everyone likes doing that sort of thing, um, and you know, and a, maybe a better way to look at trends is in graphs, which we'll go to next. Yeah. Um, but you know, as I said before, you know, for tomorrow we know that we're going to have this this breeze. You know, we're looking around. 13, 14 knot averages, you know, with, um, you know, with gusts around the 20s. And then we know into the afternoon, it's going to die. So, you know, and it looks like it's most likely going to trend to the right. So, yeah, good stuff to know. Um, there is a lot of parameters in here, uh, you know, and understanding how to use them all together can be really important you know for instance you know we have some rain we have some cape cape is convective available potential energy um that's energy in the atmosphere probably pretty important uh, in your part of the world because you put the rain and the cape together they are thunderstorm indicators uh, and again you know with the the cloud are they isolated? You know, we've got lower amounts of cloud or we've got 100% cloud. Are they isolated or is it just an actual, you know, frontal system moving through with a bit of kick to it? I'll just check the Q&A because I don't know whether... Um, oh, yeah, we will get to the... Seeing which we, where the model has been accurate in the last week. We'll, we'll, we'll jump onto that shortly. Um, but there's a lot of information in here. Um, as my wife would say, you know, she'd look at the UV index and tell me that I had, need to make sure I put sunscreen on. Um, you know, the temperature, that's important to us as sailors. Is it going to be a really hot day? Um, you know, then we can look at the high resolution modeling. Are we potentially going to, you know, is there no wind in the in the forecast? But then late in the afternoon, you see a thermal, thermal activity um, coming in. And tides, not relevant. Uh, you'll see here we wave data, so it's really important to understand the only wave data we have on the Great Lakes is the ECMWF. You would want to be looking at the ECMWF 14 kilometer resolution, it's the highest resolution wave model um, that we have, and that is does uh, a whole lot of stuff that I'll talk about in weather routing, which is, is pretty clever. So I'm not going to run through all of this stuff, um, but you know, as I mentioned for trends, um, graphs are super good for trends. We can look at a 10 day um, period or a one day. And really you'd be looking at the one day and this is where I say, you know, is the trend for the day. I'm looking at all the models and I would say the trend is increasing slightly. Um, and then, you know, same with your direction. So uh, wind maps, we can look through all the different models and we can see their resolutions. The NAM is actually at 5K. This is a mistake that's being fixed right now. Uh, 5K resolution um, and the HUR at three. So you get that the more detail and we can actually go to the, the PWE and, we, and as we zoom in and out, the resolution will automatically change. Um, not everyone likes um, streamlines. You can have wind barbs uh, if you want, uh, or arrows with the color ton contours. It depends what you like. I'm a massive fan of um, of the streamlines, but you know you don't have to. Yeah, you know, you've got the options there. Um, the wind barbs can be quite interesting to sort of look at resolution uh, because they do those boxes do indicate each um, each resolution. So you see there as we zoom out on the GFS and we 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 flick to the the different resolutions. And then if I went to the ECMWF, you know you can see the high resolution modeling. Same with the NAM. So, um, 
Yeah, so really important to know uh, wind maps, you're looking at average wind speeds. So if we go to the gust map, you'll see we get a pretty different um, picture. Probably wasn't that helpful changing uh, formats at the same time. Um, but, you know, gusts can be 40% higher than the average. Um, and so really important to go and look at your gust maps, um, especially when you start looking at weather routing as well. But for any day out, um, you know, looking at the wind maps and the gust maps or the difference between, we will actually have uh, in the tables, if you get a really big uh, difference between them, you'll actually get warnings popping up along here. I don't think we can see any. There's a warning here. Uh, There's a lightning warning. So you will see warnings pop up in the forecast if they're, um, if they're, if they're picked up. Uh, as I mentioned before, CAPE, something that's really important uh, for you to keep an eye on. Um, it is a forecast, you know, looking at this, uh, it's more of a, this is a, a potential thing. So we look at the purple and we're all good. Um, and you see here, we actually get to the end of the NAM uh, forecast range. And so we can't see what's coming. So what do we flick over to a different model? And, you know, we see these higher levels of CAPE. And, you know, we would, as the week goes on, we would want to start thinking about how this, you know, what's going on and how this how this is going to affect us. Is there rain with it, um, et cetera? As I mentioned before, the wave maps, uh, you want to look at the ECMWF 14K. Why isn't that? Oh, that is working. It's just really flat. <laughs> Um, and I'll zoom in. I did compare this to some observations. It's actually doing a pretty good job at the moment. Um, up the lake, you know, that you've got a 1.3 meter wave height further up the lake. Um, but yeah, wave modeling is, is uh, really integrated into our weather routing now and departure planning. Uh, we probably don't need to look at all of these things. Um, so someone was asking before about the validation. Um, and so that's, this is where we can compare how uh, the models have been performing over uh, the different periods. And you'll see here, I'm looking at one day. And so what it means by one day is it's been looking at for the last week it's been looking at the the forecast for that day so um where i am it's tuesday so it's been looking at the forecast for wednesday and then on wednesday it's looking at the forecast for thursday it's done that showing the last week um and averaging it's the mean average error and so we've got the mean average error for then it's during daylight hours for the wind speed and the direction and you'll see that for wind speed, uh, ECMWF, NAM, and the PWG have been doing uh, the best, and then the GFS and the PWE have been doing the worst. Um, and so that's a, that that error is a not. Um, so yeah, and then this the direction, the NAM, you know, you'd sort of think the NAM's been doing a pretty good job, and you know, especially, you know, well, it is doing a very good job on the direction. Um, so that's, you know, if the forecasts were um, saying different things, you would sit, you would, you might put more weight on what the NAM is, is showing you. Um, and we can actually see that for the last month as well. So over that one day period for the last month, how is it, you know, which model's been performing the best and you can, it's actually not too different. So that's actually pretty interesting to see. Um, and then this is where the validation is actually taking place. It must be using this observation here. Um, so that's actually what you can see which particular spot, because it is just for a spot that it's comparing um, the model. Something that is super interesting is basically uh, the accuracy 
degradation over time um, or not. Uh, if you look at the ECMWF there, it's doing an amazing job <laughs> of uh, day seven. Um, when you look at this, the rank for the the rapid refresh and the NAM are not really fair on the other models uh, because that's only actually looking at um, day two and day, you know, the total of day two and day three for this average down here. But you can see that over time, <laughs> the model accuracy decreasing. So it's an interesting one to look at. And as I said at the start, um, I hadn't looked at this, but you can see the ECMWF is doing an amazing job uh, longer term here uh, for the wind speed. And then, you know, direction over, you know, the wind, the wind direction over uh, in the future, you know, these numbers are pretty big. That's, that's degrees. Um, so, you know, none of them are doing a particularly awesome job, um, you know, past sort of day four, five. They, um, yeah, definitely not doing a, a, that great a job. So, yeah, worth having a play around if you're interested in that sort of stuff. Personally, for uh, I like looking at the one-day stuff because I'm always updating my forecast and looking at the latest data. So knowing which model's performing well in the short term um, is, you know, really interesting. Um, and this does change. Like, so it's actually always updating. So if I have a look at where, where I live, and this should change, hopefully. Maybe if I go to a different parameter and then go back to the validation. So, yeah, I know that where I live in Auckland, that um, not so much in winter, it's winter here, but in summer, I know this is this, the PWG is my favorite model by miles. I mean, people, we don't try and pick <laughs> models, but in summer here in Auckland, the PWG does an awesome job. Um, and even at the moment, it's doing a, a, a pretty good job. Um, for wind speed, uh, direction, the, the models, no, you know, they're not performing massive, not one's not really performing massively better than the other. Um, and then, yeah, over the last month for one day as well. So, by all means, go in there, have a look, set some different locations up, um, and see what, 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 what you get. You know, you go to the northern end of uh, the lake, you might get some different results. I haven't looked. Okay, so we've looked at sort of the the basic sort of things that we can, um, you know, that we can access and look at. And, and, and you can see a lot of that stuff, lots of places, maybe different models. Um, but, you know, being able to, you know, compare stuff in there um, and, you know, the validation tool, et cetera. You know, there's some, it, there's a lot that you can dive into there. Um, and, uh, you know, even, even just through the, the wind maps. Uh, something I should have pointed out is you can actually, um, in the wind maps, I can actually toggle uh, two different uh, models, and um, and you know see the different models. Why am I showing different? Uh... I can look at. I can compare two different models. I can um, go through time and you know see how they differ. So it's actually pretty cool using the split screen. That was this little toggle. Toggle button up here. Okay. How long have I been talking for? Ricky, yeah. Um, righty home. So this is super important. Observations. You can see observations um, in the forecast website, in the Predict Wind app. And most importantly, you can see observations in the offshore app. So you can, uh, if you're on a satellite connection, um, you know, whether that was an Iridium satellite connection, uh, you know, Iridium Go or Iridium Go Exec, we'll talk a little bit about comms tomorrow, or, you know, any type of connection, you can um, download observations. But being able to see it if you're on a, in a, in a slow -er satellite connection is pretty awesome. Um, 
and what you know why i mean apart from seeing what is actually happening um you know because observations are real time you may know uh, i don't uh, but you may know which of these observations are better than others you can see that um, there's some close together and they're reading quite differently so the quality of an observation is really important and so that's something you can learn we do have a um a rating um a rating for for an observation um and so it is quite handy if you go and rate uh observations that are good or not maybe you don't want to maybe you just want to keep that to yourself um but you yeah, you can go and put ratings in for the observations and uh i put in a lot of observations uh with one of my colleagues around auckland for the america's cup when it was here last and you know even in a short distance um you know the the quality of the observation is is super important I, you know we put one on a lighthouse and we actually put another one on and the difference between those two observations they're a meter apart um because the um the coast guard here wouldn't let us put it above the light um for, for probably quite good reasons um so we ended up having to put two on but the, just that small wind shadow from the light um we get i don't know eight nine knots difference in the web observation so yeah knowing what's good uh, observation wise is really important um and then the cool thing about this is I can actually go through the models and see which one is lining up with the observations. So, you know, the NAM looks like it's doing a pretty good job down here where our um, we were just looking at the observations, uh, looking at the validation. Um, but then is it doing as good a job up here? I don't, that's you know, I don't know the quality of these observations. Yeah, I don't know what that is. But over time, I'm sure that for those of you that live there, you can look at them all. But yeah, being able to see what's happening up the up the lake can help you with your, your real-time decisions, uh, especially when you're racing. Okay, go out of there. Um, I'll super briefly touch on this um as you can see we can see AIS targets in there there's someone's boat oh it's a not probably not someone's boat probably looks like a ferry or something um <clears throat> but what we can do is if we look at any of these locations we can go in here and view details and we can look at this uh historical weather data so this is for that particular spot we can look at the and so this is not so much important, not so important if it's somewhere where you live, but if you're going somewhere else, uh, we can go and have a look at the, the wind rows for that month uh, for any um, any particular time. So it's pretty interesting, uh, especially if you're going to new locations for um, regattas or whatever you're doing. <clears throat> okay, so tools. Uh, I think we'll briefly touch on weather routing and then we'll probably wrap it up because I um, only planned on talking for an hour. So we'll go in here and we'll just briefly look at the weather routing tool. Um, if you haven't used weather routing before, uh, you should go and give it a go. It's, it's pretty cool. Um, it is, you know, uh, you know, racing navigators have been using weather routing for years. Um, there's some pretty complicated ways uh, and tools that you can get, you know, where you've got to download your grubs and then you've got to put them all in and, uh, you know, to your system and then run your weather route. And, um, you know, one of our goals is, as I mentioned at the start, is trying to make weather accessible and understandable to everyone. Um, and, you know, our weather routing tool is super powerful. Uh, we actually have a, a gentleman in Sweden who is, that's just his job, is working on our weather routing engine. Um, it's very, very clever um, and does some, some pretty awesome stuff. So I'll zoom in and I will pay no particular attention 
to really where I'm going to put it. And I'm just actually before we do that, to run any weather routing, you need to, um, and maybe this is something you can go away and think about tonight if you don't know, um, is you need to ha have some polars. So what polars are is the expected performance of your boat. So in any condition. And so whether it's yeah, and, and any wind true wind angle. So whether it's, you know, 10 knots at um 43 degrees true wind angle, or whether it's, you know, you know, you're running at um 145 or whatever, uh, you know, how fast does your boat go? And you know, 15 knots or whatever it is. And so we have a, a selection in here where you can um and I'm going to go through this again tomorrow because it's super important. Um, and probably again in our third webinar. But we have all these boats in here, and you know, we can select one. What shall we be? I don't know. So exciting. So exciting. It's just like buying a boat. Uh, let's be a Swan 48. Um and we can put that in there and you and we can see this is our polar curve. Uh, I've got no idea why it does that funky thing there. Uh, but if this was my boat, I'd go and look at that. Um, and you, you're like, well, how do I know what it's doing? We can we can look at this curve, this polar curve and see for each, uh, you know, in eight knots and at this wind angle, how fast are we going? Personally, I prefer to come over here and copy it copy it to the advanced polar and then I can click on advanced and I've got this table here and so this is what polars that work in the system actually look like um, and so you can see down here we have our true wind speed um, and so this is this always uses the averages um, and then we've got our true wind angle in this column here and then the boat speed so in 10 knots at 41.6 degrees because we're always sailing at 0.6 uh, true wind angle, the boat's going to do 5.38 knots. This is a pretty, this looks like a fully computer generated polar to me. So I'd use, um, I might do 5.3, but I wouldn't do 5.38. Um, but anyway, you see the whole way through the spectrum here, you know, 90 true wind angle, 12 knots, we're doing 8.9 knots. Um, you know, and then through to when we start running really deep, uh, you know, we've got our speeds for the different, you know, the true wind angle and the boat speed at that wind speed. So that's what your polars are. Um, it's something that I would start thinking about if you haven't thought about it. Um, they, you know, because having your polars as best you can is going to give you better weather routing results. Um, so we will talk about polars again tomorrow. Um, and if you do want to know about polars, reach out to our support team. I'll tell you how to do that in a minute. So, but the screen point here is our start and this is our finish. And we can actually, um, we can put waypoints in. If there was a particular turning mark that we had to go around, go around we could put a, a starboard rounding or a port rounding in, you know, we call it a port or a starboard rounding. We can put the lat long in, um, let's call it a port, and uh, which wouldn't make sense. Well, maybe we needed to keep in through there or whatever. Um, anyway, I'll delete that. But what I'm, uh, my point of being in here is I can set the lat long for wherever I am. Um, if you're on a GPS enabled device, you can click on this button here and it would. Uh, take you to that position, uh, which is your now position. I won't do it because it'll <laughs> fly over to New Zealand. Um, anyway, so we've got our start and finish waypoints. Um, we've got our start time is now. Um, obviously, uh, I'm in the wrong time zone, but that's I'm not going to change that because that's where I am. And, you know, we've got it set for now. We could be running this. If we're close to the race, we might be running this for the actual start time. Um, and then we would click download and it will start downloading our route. Um, so we have, it's looks like we've got upwind. 
Um, and so we've got all the different weather models there. And they want us to do quite different things. We're not surprising with uh, upwind sailing. Um, but you would want to work out why that is. And then you would want to go, okay, this is what we've got. So I'm going to go with these models. Or there's only two going this way, you know, um, but there's four going this way. So maybe I go with the with the majority. Um, and or you might position yourself, uh, you know, your competitors, you might know, you might be able to, you might go and look at the tracking. Um, and see where your competitors are. You might just position yourself. You might look at this, run this through. Let's flick over to the EC, for instance. You might just go, okay, I'm going to position myself on this side of the fleet. Um, you know, it's, yeah, an interesting one. What I really wanted to sort of, uh, you know, I mean, yeah, there's, there's our, the start of our weather routing. We can click anywhere on the route. Um, and see what you know what the model thinks the conditions are there um, you know in our wave state etc um, if I come over here to the tables uh, and into this wind tab here <clears throat> you can see this is where I would come and check and see how good the polars were um, you know does my boat and in 19 knots average wind speed uh, at 57 degrees true wind angle do I do 7.4 knots yes or no um, and so there you might need to go and change your your polars a little bit um, you'll see we've got some warnings here I don't know what they are so we've got gusts so it thinks that there's a big difference between the average wind speed and the gust so that's a an indicator of instability um, and so that's just something we want to be aware of, um, that it, 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 it might be reasonably extreme because we've got a big difference. Uh, you'll see there, we, we also, if we click on this, you'll see that we've got this thing here popping up saying vertical acceleration. So what that is, is we have a very clever thing in our weather routing um, that is calculating the wave state. So it's using the ECMWF 14K for that. Um, and it's using the wind wave and then any uh, different swell states. And you can have different swell states on uh, your lake. And if, especially if a system's gone through. So you might have had, you know, a particular direction for however many days. And then there's a change that's come through. So you've got the wind wave going one way and you've got this residual um, swell going another way and that can be really ugly and so we actually can see what that looks like in our weather routing output and where we're going to get that along the route um, if I scroll down here so we see our wave height and we can look at the combi combined wind wave and swell um, I could just look at the wind wave uh, which doesn't change too much from the combined uh, and then we look at that primary swell there is a slightly different swell there and then I go to the secondary and you'll see that there basically isn't any. So it's not just making it up, um, but then at the end of our passage here, there is. Um, and so I would expect that there'd be no tertiary. So it's very clever what it's doing. Um, and it's worth uh, knowing what it's doing. Uh, and I'll explain why. So we can look at all the different parameters there. And then we come down here and we can see the roll. So the roll is RMS. That's just uh, the root mean square. We don't really need to know what that means, but it's a measure um, and it's how much you're getting thrown around. Um, or, you know, your boat's getting rolled. And so this is modelled. Um, I, I didn't touch on then the polars. We'll look at it tomorrow. But it is, you put your boat parameters in, you put your 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 waterline length, your draft, your displacement, and it's actually uh, creating a, a 3D model of your boat, and that's actually modelled throughout the route um, and telling you what you're going to get. And you might be going, well, why is this important to me? I'm racing, it doesn't really matter. Well, there's lots of good reasons. Safety would be the first one. Um, three, four, uh, two, two, to, two to three is not too bad. We, we sort of say that four degrees, um, 
RMS would be uh, is where it's starting to get really uncomfortable. We have that written there um, that it starts to get um, nasty. So if you knew that you were going to get that uh, throughout the race, you know, at some stage, you might go, okay, we're going to actually enact a, a, a higher level of safety protocol. You don't come on deck unless you're clipped on or whatever. Um, and then we uh, yeah, we got the warning for our vertical acceleration. So this is your lifting. So this is how much you're lifting. This isn't your boat slamming. Uh, this is just actually, as you go over the waves, how, how fast it's um, lifting and it's Gs. Um, and apparently this is how you, uh, I didn't realize that you can make anyone seasick, um, someone that doesn't get seasick. Um, I don't, you know, they probably don't appreciate how bad it is, but apparently you can make anyone seasick. So anything above 0.2, you know that it's going to be uh, pretty nasty. And, you know, that again, something that you could plan for and consider, um, you know, do we need is uh, who gets sick on board how do we plan for that um you know are we going to actually are we going to lose half our crew to seasickness so lake sickness in your case uh this is our slamming incident so this is your boat slamming this is something you'd want to be pretty wary of um you know if you can see this and you know this is coming you know you you might change sails earlier than you anticipated if you're going to run into a particularly nasty but same with this you know like if, if we know that we're going to run into you know the vertical acceleration is going to go up into the night you might change your sail over earlier than you necessarily want to for optimum sailing but you might do that early because that's the safer thing to do um you know do we want people up on the foredeck changing sails in the middle of the night maybe you know if it's going to be this rough so yeah some pretty important stuff to think about there um and another cool thing that it shows here um where is it gone or is it further down oh, i was looking for the somewhere in here it tells me how much it's affecting my polar i can't see it right now anyway we'll come back to that tomorrow um, but it can, you know, it tells you whether it's speeding you up or slowing you down the waves. So um, you'd think in this case, it would be slowing you down. All right, I will wrap up there. Um, we'll get dive into this tomorrow. We will be talking about, um, you know, weather routing and polars um, and some comms. So, you know, some options for comms and why that's important. So I will stop sharing. Right. There we go. Okay. Well, uh, Nick, thank you very, very much. Uh, that is a lot to digest. Uh, speak for myself. Um, I I would bet that uh, if we pulled the uh, the folks on the on the webinar here, we would get a lot of agreement on that. Um, I I guess I'll just toss it out there that if there are any questions that uh, you know you come up with uh, after we're all finished, after some of this settles in, you only have about 23 hours to wait to, uh, to get them out there. But if you wanna toss them uh, to, uh, to us in advance, that'd be fine. Uh, if there's something that uh, you, know, you, you thought maybe you'd like to hear a little bit more about or get a little bit more covered, uh, let us know, and we'll uh, we'll see if we can uh, we, we can do that. I'm not sure if everybody saw. There was one question about this being available to rewatch. Uh, it is being recorded. When exactly it will be up, I cannot speak for, uh, but I will push um, to the extent that I can uh, that that my vote has any any influence that this is available tomorrow at some point at the latest in the afternoon so that folks have a chance to watch it ahead of tomorrow evening's uh, part two. Uh, with that, I wanna thank you. I want to wish Nick to have a good day, not a good evening because he's that much ahead of us. Uh, and with that, I think we'll wrap it up uh, and we will uh, be back. Uh, I guess one quick question, Nick, are you anticipating about the same amount of time, maybe an hour and 15 minutes? Yeah, I think, Tomorrow. As you say, that it's, 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 you know, it's quite a lot to take in. And I probably, you know, like, I think, 
I think if you go any longer that you just phase out and um as much as I like talking I don't think I can talk longer than that um <laughs> but yeah I think it's just too much to take in and I think you know we probably the we will essentially recover a lot of stuff like so something that I said today that you kind of went what's he talking about I, as we keep looking at it more and more the stuff will actually get covered over and over again and 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 you know that does sort of uh become more um you know more, makes more sense um and if you do have questions between now and then you can reach out to our support team you can email them on support at predictwin.com um they are they are awesome people you know like there's a, um, a couple of them there that have actually done the Chicago Mac before and um you know I think four of them are ex Volvo Ocean Race sailors, so they they know what they're talking about. Yeah, I think it's very worth pointing out. Thank you for bringing that up. Um, I had it in my notes. I, I believe is it still the case that everybody at um, Predict Wind is a sailor? I mean, has significant sailing experience? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Especially on the on the support desk, and and I think um, you know, and and each of them have uh, different skills as well so you know if someone doesn't know something uh you know they might they'll hand, hand that over to uh, you know another person in the team but yeah they're all they're all sailors so they're definitely you're not getting um some sort of um slapstick answer you're usually getting something uh, pretty considered great yeah i think that's that's very important we're not just getting we're getting a group of very smart people who really know this stuff but also know the practical end of it so uh, yeah, well worth keeping in mind. All right, uh, with that, we'll say good night to everybody on this side of the uh, the ocean, and uh, good day to you. And we'll see you tomorrow. Thank you very much. See ya. Thank you.